be people up in North London whose ears prick up every time they hear that, I guess, mm. thinking we're discussing their football team. Yes. What is the relationship of Arsenal in this area? Well, the relationship with the football team is that uh, the uh, Arsenal had a, uh, a foundry, uh, a gun-making foundry, one of many, in fact, and they imported some uh, specialist iron founders from County Durham. Well, these chaps bought football with them. And, um, so we've got Northerners to blame. Well, that's correct, actually. <laughs> um, they uh, wanted to uh, start a football mat, a football team in the Arsenal, and uh, they did so uh, with, as we know, very, very great success. And funnily enough, the building where they founded it is still there today, and it's now a pub. Is there a plaque or anything, I wonder? Yes, there, there is. is right actually. outside the pub's front door, there is a little, a little plaque uh, to explain this is where Arsenal Football Club was founded. Hence the cannons on their badge and all of that. Yes, exactly. And there are, I believe, I mean, certainly Fable has it up in North London, because I live, you know, very close to Arsenal. Mm. There are still a few supporters who've always supported them from down in this area and go I, up I'm to the games. I'm absolutely and... sure that's the case, yes. I think it's, it's either Tarleton or it's Arsenal, one or the other other um i mean the uh, the, the ties go back a very long way so it's just before they went to highbury they for instance they played on plumstead common right i'm not much of a football uh, expert no but I in terms of the history that's oh, yeah. kind of it is it is a fascinating part of this world the gatehouse hasn't yet assumed its final state it didn't do that until the second boer war in about 1900 1902 something like that but notice these two little things here, which appear white or grey in this colour. And they're still there when the gatehouse is expanded. These are the perfect way to finish off a talk about the Royal Arsenal. So I'm very glad they were fitted there. <laughs> we better have a look, it's better have a look at them, haven't they? They are the crest of the Board of Ordnance, not the full, uh, the full coat of arms by any means, but they are the crest, and of course here, draws the fourth, being celebrated. Um, beneath it is the Board of Ordnance's motto, and uh, a motto shared by the Royal Arsenal, and uh, later the Royal Army Ordnance, Ordnance Corps. And if you translate Sua Tila Tomanti, literally into English, it says from Jupiter to those who thunder, which is probably why you've got flashes of lightning on here. Now, of course, nobody goes around saying from Jupiter to those who thunder, it's a bit lengthy. And so the usual contracted translation in universal use um, is, is much shorter, it's only four words, and they are the absolute perfect way of concluding anything about the Arsenal, because they describe it so brilliantly. Um, they just get on and do the job, and could not do it, and there is no better way of doing it. Just like the Royal Arsenal, Suatina Tonanti is usually um, translated as to the warrior arms. And with those quite appropriate words, I thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> And talking about the historical connections of this area, and obviously, you know, if, if you include Greenwich, and we are very much in the, in the borough of Greenwich, they're extraordinary. But not just Greenwich, Woolwich itself, I mean, particularly with the Arsenal, and I don't mean the football team, although we might come on to that, has an incredible historical story to tell. And maybe the man sitting opposite me can help us do that. He's Ian Ball, and he gives local history walks around this part of South East London. Ian, as I say, you've got to welcome me rather than the other way around, because <laughs> I'm very much the visitor and tourist down here. And I have to say, is the first, I mean, I've been to, to Charlton to go and watch football matches, because um, my team used to play them on a regular basis when we were in the same division. Um, but these, uh, other than that, I don't know this part of the world, and I've never been to the Woolwich Arsenal. Shame upon me. Well, welcome. And uh, it's not a bad area at all, actually. And strangely enough, I don't come from round here either. So uh, you're, you're an import as well? I am. I'm an imposter. I'm from Battersea. But uh, the uh, walks that I lead for Walk London, um, the uh, walking organisation of the Mayor's Office, um, has brought me here on very many occasions. And I thought, what a fascinating place. I walked into the local history museum, the Greenwich Heritage Centre, a few years ago, and there on the wall was a huge map of the Royal Arsenal, and I could hardly believe what I was looking at. What, just the scale of it? Oh, or? the sheer size. It was three and a quarter miles long, 
It covered two square miles altogether. Wow. Um, and as I think the mayor may already have told you, at one point it employed just over 100,000 people. That's incredible, isn't it? 100,000 people employed yes. in the arsenal. Yes. When would that have been? Are we sort of First World War yes, period? Yes, that's the peak of the First World War. It was 79,000 uh, civilians working within the arsenal, further 20,000 within the surrounding streets, and on top of that you would have had the military contingents. So you're comfortably over 100,000 there. And I guess, I mean, the Arsenal obviously did what it did. It made munitions and it made, made yeah. arms, I yes, guess. Yes, that's, that's what it did through its entire life. From uh, It started theoretically in about, uh, 19, uh, about 1571, but in, in reality it had been, the area had been used for military purposes, gun testing, for instance, before that. Is, it, is the proximity to the river important for Yes, that? very important. Uh, the Arsenal's two great advantages were that it had easy shipping access, it was very close to the Woolwich Royal Naval Dockyard, which yep. opened in 1515, and was in close communication, or easy communication, with the uh, dockyard at uh, Deptford and also at Chatham and Sheerness. I guess in both directions, you, you've got naval history all around you, haven't you? Because obviously yeah. Greenwich with the, you know, the Royal Navy there and, and yeah. an absolute centre. But as you say, going out towards the estuary and Chatham and the Royal Naval dockyards there. Yeah. So you're in the very kind of centre of, of, of the British naval tradition, I guess. Oh, absolutely. But the Arsenal wasn't only a naval establishment. It was also extremely heavily connected with all the services, um, um, the, the Army and the Air Force in its later days. So we this area that we're in now, would it have, I mean, would it have grown up as a, as a sort of a hinterland to the Royal Arsenal? Very much so. It was by far the largest employer. Um, I, I doubt if you'd find any family that's been in South East London for more than, say, two generations who hasn't had a relative working in it. Um, it was by far the biggest employer and continued to be that for a very, very long time. And it was almost like a, a closed area. It was almost a sort of a walled city, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. The local name was the Secret City. Really? Um, and and with, with good reasons, too, because the work it did was, in certain areas, very, very confidential. Uh, it did develop the, uh, a large amount of the development work on the atomic bomb was done wow. there. Um, and uh, the security was extremely tight. Uh, in fact, in the uh, words of a friend of mine, uh, who unfortunately can't be here today, uh, you couldn't have got a biro out of the place. Is that Ray who was going That's to be joining Ray, us? Yeah, because uh, he'd been working there for, for since before the Second World War. Yeah, he it? spent his entire working life there, and uh, through the uh, Arsenal's historical society, I think we can say that he still is. <laughs> but unfortunately, a little possibly not too well to do that today. Um, what happened to the to the Arsenal in terms of its decline? Why why did it decline? The decline really came in during the second during the First World War. Uh, because of the invention of aerial bombardments. Right. Uh, Luftwaffe aircraft were able to come here and bomb the arsenal with success during the First World War, up until that Even time. in the First World War in they the were First bombed. World War. So that wasn't oh, yeah. Zeppelin raids, that was... Uh, no, it was aircraft, actually. Right. Because um, we always associate that, of course, with the Battle of Britain, or then the Blitz and the Second World War. Yes. But, but it happened in the First World War oh, as yes. well. Oh, yes, yeah. It was the first... It was the aerial bombardment in the First World War that led the uh, authorities to realise that here you had a large military establishment with all the eggs in one basket yep. with up to 20,000 tonnes of high explosive in it in London. And it was decided very rapidly that it had to be dispersed. And uh, the uh, rundown began almost immediately after the uh, First World War and it continued uh, right up until 1967 when the Arsenal uh, stopped manufacturing its last... So that was when the last kind of munitions and that would have been That's manufactured? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was making uh, Centurion tanks, uh, repairing Centurion tanks and also manufacturing munitions up until that date. Because it certainly got bombed again even more, didn't it, in the Second yes, World War? Yes, yep. Uh, it, in fact, uh, a large part of the Arsenal's equipment was moved out for a while because of the, uh, the fear that too much destruction would be done. Had there been accidents before that? Because there must have been the occasion. It must have been certainly great worry if you were living nearby. I would have thought. Overall, the Arsenal had a remarkably good safety record. There were really very few accidents over the years, con considering the uh, enormous tonnage of high explosives that it manufactured. I mean, it made literally billions of rounds of ammunition in the First World War. Although accidents through explosions were very rare, it's probably worth pointing out that many of the munitions workers during the First World War uh, did suffer quite badly from ingesting nitric acid. Was it acid sulphur or nitric acid? It's nitric acid fumes, right. and uh, particularly amongst the female workforce who uh, 
were mainly used on shell filling, and uh, they uh, did uh, suffer very badly as a result. Now, tell me about the the, the steam locomotive and, the, oh, and your campaign yes. for that. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Royal Arsenal and its two square miles once had 130 miles of railway line. What? Yeah, 100... In two square miles? That's had 130 right. miles of yep. line? it was the densest railway network we ever had in this country, and uh, it had... Not only did it have main line gauge, like every other line in the country, it also had little railways with rails just 18 inches apart. So a little narrow gauge railway. That's right. And because they could go well, around... Was that moving, moving equipment around, yep. moving the it, munitions it, 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 and all of it that? All, absolutely everything. It would be used like forklift trucks or conveyor belts, and they went to literally every workshop. Every, every workshop and And these would have been steam bridge. locomotives? Yep. They the used, steam must have been extraordinary. Oh, yes. Even inside the buildings. They uh, had up to... They had about 80 working at any one time, and they worked 24 hours a day, wow. not only on goods, but also on passengers. Well, one of them survives. Wow. What, what sort of gauge? What have you, what's still It's an 18-inch gauge one. Right. There are two standard gauge ones elsewhere in the country, but uh, a couple of months ago we brought back the uh, last 18-inch gauge one to this area for restoration, and the Royal Arsenal Railway will come back. It's, um, you seem confident of this. I am. I'm completely confident of it. Uh, it's such a good project, I can't see it failing. It's at the Crossness Pumping Station, which is right next door to the Arsenal, but at the other end, out in Bexley. Right. And that's uh, probably... Uh, but it is the, the, the finest Victorian pumping station in the United Kingdom and one of our best Victorian landmarks. It's absolutely beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah. And they have plenty of room and facilities for locomotive restoration. And so the uh, locomotive is there, and it's currently being uh, taken to bits. And uh, once we've restored it, back together again, and then it will start running. I was going to say, start running where and, and for whom? Well, it's going to be running initially in the rather extensive grounds of Crossness Pumping Station. Right. But uh, we have cast an imaginative eye outside... I, I'm afraid I can't at the moment say exactly what the possibilities might be. But you could be but getting... I, I could, let me imagine. Let me envisage the scene. You could potentially be getting a chain from the Woolwich Arsenal up to the Crossness Pumping Station or something. Well, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? It would. It would, yeah. It's a very good idea. People are listening. Yeah, it's a very good idea, isn't it? When do you think, when do you think in, in, in any form whatsoever that the train will, be, will, will make oh, its first journey? Oh, give us 18 months to two years. OK. Because we, uh, we have to take the locomotive spoiler out and it may need extensive repairs. We hope not. Uh, but we've got some very good engineers and even some botters like me. Ian, if people want to come on one of the tours, where can they find out more? Right, if you want to find out more about the walking tours that go on in this area, the place to go is uh, Walk London. Dot org dot uk or greentrain.com. Now, uh, the Green Train Walk is the uh, principal footpath network in this area, and Walk London uh, offer, foot, offer uh, walks on it um, every few months, and the next ones are over the 24th and the 25th of September. They are also doing about 48 other walks across London. Uh, the website will be showing those walks from the middle of August. And I can't imagine them getting a better guide than Ian Bull. Ian, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thanks, Robert.